Anthropology is commonly defined as the study of human societies, cultures, civilizations, and their development, as well as human biological variation and physiological characteristics, which is another term for races and how they came about. In the field of physical anthropology, there are two main concepts taught at the university level that stand out above all others. The first is the importance of agriculture in regards to civilization. And I don't mean tossing some seeds in the ground and eating what pops out, but large scale food production, enough to feed the entire community with enough left over to store and to trade, allowing a segment of the population to engage in other activities, such as creating metals, sailing across oceans, building pyramids or megalithic structures, high art, language, architecture, and all the things that differentiate modern man with what we refer to as hunter-gatherers. While there's nothing wrong with being a hunter-gatherer, and I know many people, including myself, that in many ways envy that sort of simplistic lifestyle, in an anthropological context, they tend to be restricted to small tribes of usually under 40 people, spend most of their time struggling to survive, and while physically considered anatomically correct, historically speaking, they were not considered modern. So for example, while many people like to say hominins, such as Homo erectus, which survived to perhaps around 30,000 years ago, and that walked upright, were anatomically correct, meaning they had two arms, two legs, a head, and so on, they were not modern Homo sapiens sapiens. Without the sustenance that comes with agriculture, and with a cranial capacity of under 900 cubic centimeters, they were simply not modern humans. Incidentally, the average cranial capacity for people of the Holocene, our current age, is around 1300 cubic centimeters, depending on certain factors, such as ethnicity. While there are many articles that claim our brains have shrunk over time, this is misleading. The reduction in brain size is due to the hybridization of our species, as the first fully modern human was Cro-Magnon, with some specimens having a cranial capacity of over 1,700 cubic centimeters, who then mated with other hominin species, such as Denisovans, and some other species in Africa that have yet to be identified in the fossil record, only seen in comparing sequenced genomic data and labeled as a ghost species, which I suspect is Homo erectus or another archaic hominid. Everything other than Cro-Magnon is archaic, including Neanderthal, which had a considerably larger cranial capacity than the African hominins, or even the modern average. It also had different dentation, meaning teeth, a massive brow ridge, or eyebrow bone, no forehead, and mid-facial prognathism, meaning its mouth area sticked out from its face, a simian-like or archaic feature and one that is not associated with agriculture. Neanderthal also had a different shaped cranium, which resembles more of a football rather than round like a basketball, like most modern skulls are. I'd also like to clear up one other point about Neanderthal. No specimen has ever turned up Rh negative, and no Neanderthal has even been shown to be a recessive carrier of Rh negative blood. So the people who seem to think Europeans are essentially Neanderthals, that's false, they're not, and only carry from 1-5% to Neanderthal DNA, and in some cases, an admixture of other hominin species as well. But the base phenotype is Cro-Magnon, which I've stated previously is the origin of Rh negative blood type. Since Cro-Magnon is the only hominin ever discovered to have a chin, the only specimen that is considered fully modern, it would make sense that they were agriculturalists, since the lack of prognathism, meaning the flat face and mouth, is an indicator of using the back molars to chew with, implying a diet of vegetables and grown food. The problem is, modern anthropologists claim that agriculture came about during the Holocene, meaning the last 10 to 12,000 years or so and Cro-Magnon shows up in Europe 35,000 years ago, fully developed. 
So if what I say is true, that Cro-Magnon had a larger brain than even today's modern average and had fully modern facial and dental features, meaning those attributed to an agricultural diet, then why is evidence of agriculture or domesticated animals during the Ice Age or late Pleistocene so hard to come by? This brings us to the second important concept taught to every anthropologist, which is the significance of the event at the end of the last Ice Age or late Pleistocene, which ushered in our current Holocene age, and it cannot be overstated. It was so cataclysmic, affecting the entire planet, that there's nothing in our historic memory to compare it to, except myths and legends, such as the biblical flood, or Plato's description of the sinking of Atlantis, or other flood myths, such as those found from around the New World, particularly ancient South America. Although this scenario has been downplayed by the mainstream media, probably because it validates biblical stories such as that of an ancient deluge and legendary tales of lost civilizations, I came across this recent article with the headline, Researchers Say Day After Tomorrow Scenario Could Have Been Caused by Melting Icebergs. The article goes on to say that, as the earth began to thaw when the last ice age came to an end about 13,000 years ago, melting sea ice in the Arctic poured fresh water into the salty North Atlantic and drastically changed the world's climate, a new study suggests. The study, published in the journal Geology, proposes a new mechanism for the influx of fresh water into the ocean that scientists believe altered currents like the Gulf Stream which brings heat from the equator to North America and Europe. James Teller, a professor at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada, said, quote, I think this paper will be a widely cited contribution that may become part of the accepted conclusions about where large volumes and flows of water came from that have been implicated in past large-scale global climate change. This article speaks to a time of global climate change, where glaciers rapidly melted, causing a 400-foot rise in global sea levels, and at the same time, volcanoes and earthquakes were common, and the planet's fauna, which means animals, experienced mass extinctions, including many hominin species. Hominin means walking primates, like humans, whether they be modern or archaic and archaic just means old or primitive. So let's review. The first fully modern Homo sapien shows up 35,000 years ago. No hominin over 35,000 years ago used bow and arrows. No hominin over 35,000 years ago threw spears. They might have tied a pointy rock to a stick and used it to stab prey with, but no spears. No bifacial tool technology, no atoll atolls, which is something used to make spears go further, and no hominin other than Cro-Magnon had a chin, which is understood as an agricultural trait. And we know that this first fully modern, big-brained race interbred with other archaic or primitive species, bringing about hybrids, which we call races. I understand this concept is controversial, but it's taught in every university for over a decade now so you should probably get used to it. This article says, evidence mounts for interbreeding bonanza in ancient human species, quote, adding to the growing sense that sexual encounters among different ancient human species were commonplace throughout their history. This headline reads, ancient humans rampantly interbred with Neanderthals and a mystery species in Lord of the Rings style world of different creatures. So the point I'm trying to make is the only group that can be scientifically called modern, which DNA testing shows to be identical to certain European populations, interbred with other species, which are separate species. Neanderthal is not a modern human species, either is Homo erectus or anything other than Cro-Magnon. They made it and we are their offspring. And that's why they're different races, not one race, that left Sub-Saharan Africa and adapted to different environments because of different amounts of sunshine. But hybridization of different species, 
the way a lion and a tiger mating and producing a liger is different than seeing a lion move to a different area and evolved or mutated a different physical appearance, different behavior, different IQ, etc. This genetic admixture is expressed by Plato in his writings about the decline of Atlantean civilization in 360 BC. Quote, For many generations, as long as the divine nature lasted in them, they were obedient to the laws and well affection towards the God whose seed they were, for they possessed true and in every way great spirits. However, over time, the Atlanteans became corrupt. Quote, when the divine portion began to fade away and became diluted too often and too much with the mortal admixture and the human nature got the upper hand, they then, being unable to bear their fortune, behaved unseemly, and to him who had an eye to see grew visibly debased. That said, in my book Species with Amnesia, I publish evidence of Ice Age animal domestication by a Cro-Magnon, including Paleolithic engravings of horses with straps and bridles, which are 30,000 years old. This is important because domesticated animals are required in early agricultural civilizations, and these engravings go against the mainstream notion that the horses were hunted and not ridden. DNA evidence is also suggesting dog domestication goes back at least 30,000 years to the Cro-Magnon era. The Canary Islands, incidentally, where we find the mummified remains of the Guanches, who in a recent video I identify as a direct descendant of Cro-Magnon, are not named after the canary bird, but instead from the Latin word for dog, canaria, as when the Europeans first arrived, they found large domesticated dogs on the islands. And this brings us to the transitional period between the Pleistocene or Ice Age and the Holocene, our current age, when following major cataclysms, rapidly melting glaciers, rising sea levels, and global flooding, we find agriculture, domesticated animals used in agriculture, and the oldest known megalithic stone monuments all in one place in the world, which happens to be the same place that Noah was said to have settled in Anatolia, near Mount Ararat, from where agricultural civilization diffused from, not to mention all the languages that are part of the Indo-European or Aryan language family, including Sanskrit, Farsi, Latin, English, German, French, Spanish, and about 440 other languages. So what about the languages that are not Indo-European or Aryan, such as the North African Berbers or the Amazigh languages, spoken by large populations of Morocco, Algeria, Libya, and parts of Tunisia and Egypt? And let's not forget about the language of the Basque, called Euskara, which is also not an Indo-European language. I'll start by saying that while not very similar linguistically, the Berbers and the Basque share genetic affinities, both having a very high percentage of Rh negative blood and both also being direct genetic descendants of Cro-Magnon. It is interesting to note that the Basque mythology states that they originated in a land called Atlantica, and the Berbers live near a mountain they call Mount Atlas. According to sequence DNA, there was a split in Cro-Magnon type ancestry into what became two haplogroups around 20 to 25,000 years ago. These two factions went to war, and rather than give you a technical explanation, let us turn once again to mythology and let the ancient Egyptians tell the tale. Over 2,000 years ago, a wise priest in Egypt named Sankis told a respected Greek statesman, Solon, a spectacular legend recorded in stone, translated to Greek from ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs about powerful seafaring empires, massive global cataclysms, and a great war of the Titans. Many great and wonderful deeds are recorded of your state in our histories, but one of them exceeds all the rest in greatness and valor. For these histories tell of a mighty power which unprovoked made an expedition against the whole of Europe and Asia, 
and to which your city put an end. This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean. Now in this island of Atlantis, there was a great and wonderful empire which had rule over the whole island and several others, and over parts of the continent, and furthermore, the men of Atlantis had subjugated the parts of Libya within the columns of Hercules as far as Egypt, and from Europe as far as Terrania. This vast power, gathered into one, endeavored to subdue at a blow our country and yours and the whole of the region within the straits. And then, Solon, your country shone forth in the excellence of her virtue and strength among all mankind. She was preeminent in courage and military skill and was the leader of the Hellenes. And when the rest fell off from her, being compelled to stand alone after having undergone the very extremity of danger, she defeated and triumphed over the invaders and preserved from slavery those who were not yet subjugated and generously liberated all the rest of us who dwell within the pillars. But afterward, there were occurred violent earthquakes and floods. In a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis, in like manner, disappeared in the depths of the sea. In my book, I call this Atlantean myth part of the Cro-Magnon invasions and part of the story of how Europe actually was populated 35,000 years ago, rather than from magically mutating sub-Saharan African Homo erectus that allegedly marched out of Africa, which is the real fairy tale. This very real cataclysm, which historically happened, according to Plato, took place about 11,500 years ago which is the exact date given for the end of the Pleistocene and start of the Holocene in any anthropology or geology classroom. To continue quoting the Egyptians via Plato, you remember only one deluge, though there have been many. You and your fellow citizens are descended from the few survivors that remained, but you know nothing about it because so many succeeding generations left no record in writing. While this may be true, many pre-World War II authors did leave a record in writing, such as Helena Blavatsky, who asserted humanity was in the fifth root race, the Aryan race, said to have emerged from the previous fourth root race, the Atlantean root race. She also attributed Cro-Magnon to be the Atlantean race from Atlantis that populated Europe at a time decades before human DNA had been sequenced. U.S. Congressman Ignatius Donnelly, author of Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, also promoted the idea of a people called Aryans being the remnants of Atlantis and spreading out after the flood water subsided from Anatolia. There were many others, such as Manly P. Hall, Edgar Cayce, and Rudolf Steiner, who also subscribed to the idea of Atlantis and the post-cataclysmic diffusion of civilization by a people known as Aryans. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. Thank you to those who support me on Patreon. I'm grateful and appreciate the support I've been receiving. There should be a link below for those that are interested. I also appreciate anyone that shares these videos. Thank you. Please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell for updates. I also added links in the description to my social media account on Twitter and my Facebook group and page where you can post questions or make requests for future video topics. I very much look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section below. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.